Good morning, everybody. Bonjour. I specifically waited that that moment when I could say bonjour, being in Montreal. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Peter Gazarian. I'm from Macy's.com. Uh, I'm the senior architect for our um, uh, product discovery stack of the systems. And Denis Kamotsky is our principal engineer for, for the search platform. So we're going to present you some uh, um, uh, some product discovery use case, which we rolled out in production last year. Uh, we also show you how we, uh, you know, constantly working on, 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 on improving it. Specifically, like um, uh, Will has mentioned on, on his uh, uh, keynotes, we try to move search as, a, as an uh, ecosystem beyond that search box, right? Um, so we will talk about the use case, um, um, how we implemented that, how we, uh, this the, the image similarity use case. Um, Dennis will talk about the um, uh, deep learning system which um, we employ to um, find the similarities and how we constantly tune it, how we approach the tuning of the models. So really, really short about Macy's. Macy's is um, one of the biggest United States retailers with a very long history. Um, about dot com uh, and about the search and solar, um, we migrated to the uh, to the solar powered search engine in 2013, and uh, um, we we filled it with uh, quite a features um, uh, since then. So what what we see and what is the driving force uh, for us right now, uh, and I think it's not only us who see it, is that the most of the search traffic, uh, which we uh, see right now, is driven by the by the by the mobile devices, and that's the that's the key force and necessity for us to go beyond that um, typing experience, which we uh, really have um, in a good way on a, on a desktop devices, right? So, so we um, the image-based discovery. Um, if you think about the the major use cases, we could we could um, chunk them to the four big. Uh, groups, right? So this is the visual search, similarity, filtering, and the visual attribution. Just really briefly about four of them, about, about these use, uh, classes of use cases. I'll show you some screenshots. The disclaimer is that not everything which you see is in production right now. Some of them are just the prototypes. Uh, but so uh, the, the image, the more like this use case which we're going to present is in production. So I encourage uh, you to go to the, uh, our mobile website and just give it a try. Um, so visual search is pretty obvious. Customer shows the, 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 the image and uh, then she sees the, the products which are discovered based on that image. Or another uh, flavor of it is that when we, and we usually in, in retail, we on websites, we usually have these cool uh, image assets, the banners, et cetera. Uh, so what we can do is we can, we can parse this image, we can recognize that image and we can propose the, to the customer the, 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 the products, the, the viable products which are depicted on that, on that um, banner. Uh, visual similarity, the, this is what we'll, we'll, we'll talk about and show it, uh, to you today. Uh, it's kind of the, like a search, but um, more, more recommendation driven system, right? So you, you have the corpus of images, you find the image for the, similar, the list of similar images for each image in your, in your catalog and you uh, um, when customer requests the sim similar images, you'll present them to to customer. Another way to, to think about that is that um, we can use the visual recommendation signals to, for example, to resort the to, to resort the, uh, order the products on, on a, in the result sets in a particular order. Um, filtering, visual filtering, is when we um, again we. Uh, we recognize that we, we uh, you know, disband the image, uh, extract the features from the image, and we use these features uh, to give the customers the ability to filter by the visual features, rather than to, to scroll the, the, you know, the, the very long list of, of filters and click the checkboxes and um, apply these filters to the search results. Uh, and the last one is the visual attribution. This, this sort of the use cases is uh, um, some sort of the, of the um, Backend use cases in in, in, in e-commerce when we have a lot of um, offline batch jobs which process the you know the raw data about the products and generates the the attributes uh, for the products and uh, you can think about that you can um, use that image as the basis to produce the attributes or uh, you can use the image um, in addition to the uh, 
to, to, to the offline jobs and um, compare the, the information which is extracted from the image with what, what you have and uh, find, you know, find the gaps, uh, correct the mistakes, etc. Right, so kind of the second opinion too. And um, what we're gonna focus today is more like this feature. I, I briefly explained it, what it, uh, you, uh, you know, already what it is. Essentially, the, the user experience is pretty simple. Is when customer searches or something on the website or navigates the category. Um, she has the ability to, to click that, that small link under the uh, product thumbnail, which, is, um, which says more like this and to, navigate, to be navigated to the, to the page where the, the, the similar images are presented. Right, so uh, the, the experience is very simple, is uh, pretty simple. Then customer could, could dive in, right? So in, in this, um, in this um, page, again, each image could have the, the more like this link and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you think about this feature as a system, we can present it as three big functional blocks, right? So we, we need to create a collection of the images. We need to find the similarity, the, uh, the similarities, the similar images within this collection. And then we, we need to have part of the system serving that model, that similarity model to the, to the, to the customers. Right, so, and uh, again, if you think about that, um, what we have, the, 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 um, uh, the inputs of this model, the inputs of that um, uh, subsystem, and the outputs are the images from our catalog, right? These are, these are not the images taken by the customers, right? So what that means is that, first of all, we, we always have all the images which we need, we need, we need to process. These images are um, high-res images taken from uh, in the studios, right? By, 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 by the people who, who, who do it really well, right? So that means that um, um, that model could be just effectively cached, right? And uh, in this way, right? So this very, very simplistic of representation of that serving architecture, right? So that model is effect effectively is the table, right? So and in our case, it, 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 it put into the um, Cassandra database. And um, we have a pretty, sm pretty simple microservice on top of it. So it's not really a search, it's just pulling out the, the, uh, the data from the database. And we have one of the uh, layers which, you know, gathers together all the, you know, the aggregates the um, uh, microservice responses and um, services to the customers. So not, not really fancy, really very simple architecture. At the same time, um, that simplicity gives us ability um, to easily test different models in production, right? And um, run them through the, through the A-B testing. Uh, from the other side, how we, how we, how we generate the model is, um, is a bad job. It's a Spark-based pipeline, which is um, um, pulling the images through these five, uh, five steps, right? So first of all, we need to choose the images. And within our catalog and messages at the department store, within our catalog, we have the, the images which are not really even considered. <laughs> For, 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 for the image similarity. Think about the kitchen mixers, for example, right? So the kitchen uh, in this, you know, product type is not really uh, the use case of finding the, the, the mixer which is similar to that, to that mi mixer by the, only by the image, right? There is no fashion, there is no style. Uh, grouper, even within the, the images which we took as the candidates for similarity, we don't want to mix the products uh, together even if they are from the same product type. Think about the dresses. If somebody is looking the dresses, uh, the similar dresses for the for the adult dress, you don't want to show the, the baby dress, right? Though they are the same product type, same fashion, they could be same fashion, could be same long sleeve, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, same color and pattern, right? So that we uh, that that takes care of this. Then we um, vectorize and index the images, so we we tr uh, transform the we represent the uh, images in the vector space. And finally, we search, um, search the image in, uh, in the vector space, uh, finding the, the uh, for each image in, in, in this group, we find the similar images, right? So again, this, um, so this, this, uh, this is the, um, what we have in production right now, which, which is run in production, it runs on the CPUs. Um, um, so if we, um, as I said, if you, if you go to the website and give it a try, you may find um, 
that the similar images are not sometimes really similar, right? So this model is, uh, the, the, uh, this process and this model is uh, pretty simple. That's why we always try to tune it up to improve it. Uh, and as I said, that uh, our system is pretty flexible for uh, it allow, allows us to compare the, the outputs of the different models and how specifically how we tune the models, uh, how we uh, optimize it. Uh, this uh, at the time I pass the mic to, to Dennis and we'll talk about that. Thank you. One, two, three, one, two, okay. Hello everybody, um, <coughs> my name is Dennis. Um, I'm principal engineer at Macy's. So um, we start with this. And uh, um, as, as Peter mentioned, in production, if you look in your mobile device, um, the, the results of the model are mixed. Sometimes great, sometimes not so great. So we decided to spend maybe three, last three, four months trying to improve the models we have. Um, and uh, so what are the steps? What did we do? So the first thing we looked at this Spark infrastructure is great for production, uh, highly recommended. Um, you can parallelize, you, uh, you can, you know, uh, if it's a lot of images, you can use a lot of CPUs, um, but not so great for rapid experimentation. So we moved to a little bit different uh, implementation of the same pipeline. Um, so we, we transitioned from Java ecosystem to Python ecosystem. Um, and um, instead of Spark, we used um, a system called Dask. Dask is uh, very similar to Spark. It, you can distribute your uh, processing across multiple machines. Um, you can parallelize your execution. Um, but the, the key um, shared um, data uh, set abstraction is not RDD. It is um, uh, Pandas data frame and NumPy array. Uh, but it is uh, partitioned and distributed uh, Pandas data frame and NumPy array. So that's um, very easy to, uh, to use in conjunction with the majority of popular machine learning frameworks like Keras and TensorFlow. It's all Python ecosystem. Um, another um, advantage is, uh, of using this ecosystem is that we can put it on GPUs and we can go f uh, with the vertical scalability. Um, there's a pointer. We can go with vertical scalability, so, so I don't have to, you know, if, 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 if I'm a data scientist working on a model, I don't have to spin up a whole cluster. I can, I can use a, a, a machine with a lot of RAM, a uh, couple of GPUs, um, many CPU cores for non-GPU stages of processing, and uh, very importantly, SSD for images, because there's a lot of images we need to read uh, in order to process the model. So the steps um, are pretty similar to the previous uh, image with Spark. Um, We'll deep dive into these steps because the key idea is if we want to improve the model, um, what can we improve in each of these steps? Um, the, so the first step is not on this picture. You have to train the model. You have to have a deep learning model. And we'll talk about training. Once you do have a deep learning model, the first stage is vectorize. So you need to take the images, uh, pass them, feed them through your deep learning model. Um, and produce um, arrays of floating point numbers. Those we call vectors. People call them tensors, hence TensorFlow. People call them embeddings, because these are representations of images in a vector space, embeddings of images in vector space. Um, sometimes these vectors can be very large. Um, so you know, if, if, it's, if it's 1,000 units, 2,000 units, it's OK. We can search on that. If it's 100,000 units, that's too much. We need to figure out how to reduce dimensionality of that. Hence, we have a pack stage here. Uh, it converts from raw vectors into searchable vectors. Um, another advantage of pack stage is that we can bring in signals from multiple models, and we'll talk about that. Um, searchable vectors need to be indexed, just like with text, um, stored in a, in, a, in a vector space index. Um, and then, um, given that index, we can execute a nearest neighbor search. There's a couple of flavors. There's a radius search. You can say, give me everything within a certain distance. Or you can say, give me 10, 100, 500 nearest neighbors to a given image or a given embedding of an image. As far as taking this and integrating it back into the Spark Java ecosystem, uh, Solar, whatever, there's a couple of options. One is um, for the cached use case that Peter described. We can simply generate the search result and do a lightweight integration to a, to a system which serves the cached search result, like a Cassandra database. 
for a more involved integration, we can simply generate the vectors and feed them to some system which can implement its own search. So these are the, the so, so we're going to cover each of these steps um, uh, and, and look at what decisions we can make to improve the model. Um, and we have to also consider the train st step. So in a lot of cases, uh, we use what we call transfer learning. Transfer learning is where you download a model pre-trained by somebody else. Google models are very popular. Inception, Google Inception is a very popular model. Um, but you can also train a model. Um, you, can, you can start with that and um, uh, retrain or fine tune it, or you can train your own model. So when I show some results, of what we've done, um, I will be using the same sample product, which is right here. It's a patterned, red pattern dress. Um, and I'm gonna show search results in this format, which is a, a top um, 25 nearest neighbors. And of course, the dress itself is the nearest of them all. Um, this result here has no image signal whatsoever. So what we've done here is we took that dress as a product from our catalog, and we looked at all of its attributes. And we um, embedded attribute values in a TF-IDF vector. So it's actually IDF because term frequency is, is one for every attribute value. But um, there's about 22,000 unique attribute values in our catalog, so the vector size is about 22,000, right? So that's not searchable. So going back to the PAC stage that I described, dimensionality reduction, we applied latent semantic analysis reduced to about 1,000 dimensions, and that's a nearest neighbor search. So you can see that even if you look at all of your product attributes and your attribution is reasonable quality, you can get some sense of visual similarity. So no color, no pattern necessarily, but, um, but the shapes and some of the features of the dress uh, carry because that's how the dress was attributed in the first place. So the first uh, step is train and vectorize. Um, to go there, we have to, because I don't know, um, I hope everybody attended Dr. Benjo's talk, um, so maybe some of these terms are familiar, some of these terms are not familiar, so I'll just do a quick anatomy of a convolutional neural network model. This is the most popular model that people use for image processing today. Um, the input is fed through a number of layers, like in any deep learning model. The, there are special layers called convolutional layers in the CNN architecture. Uh, convolution operation is like scanning. You, you take a, a square, maybe three by three or four by four or something, um, and you scan it over the image. And in, in this square, um, there is a, a matrix that's used to multiply what you see in the image. And that's called a convolutional kernel. And the idea is that as you train through backpropagation, that, um, that square, that filter, um, learns how to detect certain features in the image, like edges or circles or arcs or something like that. And um, you have. In the input image, you have essentially a, a tensor of three rectangles, right? Red, green, blue. Um, so the depth is three. Once you apply the convolution operation, the depth increases, because you can have many of these fields. You can have 64, 500, 1,000. So the depth increases, um, and, the, and the shape decreases. And then there's pooling layer, which is also scanning um, a little square over the image, and it's kind of um, compressing averaging out what's there. There's other operations other than averaging, but you know, averaging is just for the sake of example. Um, so just to, um, to keep the, the, the total number of floating point numbers, we need to um, uh, feed through under control so it doesn't explode, doesn't become too many numbers. Because uh, all of this has to fit in your GPU RAM. That's a, so when you're buying GPU for your deep learning project, make sure it has a lot of RAM. Um, the next, uh, so typically the convolutional neural network has a stack of fully connected layers at the top. Um, and if you're thinking about transfer learning and retraining, you might actually add more fully connected layers on top of that. So as far as uh, how do you read uh, an embedding from this for the purpose of image similarity, two options. Um, 
Most people would, and, and that's what we start from, uh, most people would use the shallow embeddings. So you read the output of the fully connected layer. Um, but there's also another option, which is using deep embeddings by um, processing the, the, the output of convolutional layers themselves. And the benefit of that is that um, you, um, you get access to finer grained features, because it's not necessarily predictable what the fully connected layer expresses. So the first decision, um, what model architecture do we pick for our transfer learning? There's many. There's Inception, ResNet, MobileNet, Exception. There's a lot you can download out there. Um, it's a comparison, Inception versus MobileNet. And, and uh, it's a shallow embedding, so just the output of the top fully connected layer. Um, you can see the, the difference is considerable, uh, which means that for your data, for your project, you may want to consider a lot of networks um, and pick the best one. If you go with this approach, with the simplest approach, so what we have in production right now, it's, it's not the best. Like you can see, um, the color is not um, detected as well as we would like. <laughs> Second option is, okay, I'm gonna do something with my model. Um, I can fine tune retrain. Before I fine tune retrain, uh, what if I just randomize it? This is what we call deep image hashing. If you think about deep learning model, CNN, remember that slide, it has a structure. Some of these models like Inception are very deep and they have a lot of structure. So if you take those convolutional layers and instead of detecting certain feature like an edge, you make them um, semi-transparent. So they detect everything, they pass everything through. Just the fact that you have a stack of those convolutional and pooling operations is kind of almost like applying a zip compression to your image. And um, the result of that zip compression, as long as your images have been taken in a consistent studio setting, as long as all of those images have object in the same position, same lighting, same background, pretty good. So this is inception at the top, and this is the deep hashing with inception. So we actually unlearned what inception learned, and we got a better result. So if you do want to go with retraining, you need to think about what, um, um, what are you going to do. So, so first thing uh, is loss. So when you train a deep learning model, there is a function at the end which compares um, the output of the model to some target. And that's the gradient of, of that function that we compute and back propagate. You can have a classification loss. So you can say, oh, well, I'm going to train a model to predict whether my dress is long sleeve or short sleeve. Um, you can have a regression loss. You can build those TF-IDF vectors and predict the mean squared error of the TF-IDF vector. You can have a triplet loss, which is more interesting use case, and we'll talk about that. Uh, training method can be uh, fine tuning. You just unfreeze a couple of layers at the top. It may be deep retraining. Um, there are some, um, some gotchas with that. I'm not going to um, go deep into that, but you can read about that. And uh, you can add extra layers. So triplet loss, we added some extra layers. Uh, so everything else is frozen. We have a black box model. The interesting uh, way we train this is by creating a custom loss. So instead of a classification loss, instead of regression loss, we uh, manually, uh, using our knowledge about our business, using our uh, merchandisers who deal with these products on a daily basis, group products into what we call triplets. Um, triplet has anchor image. Um, and then a, a positive image, which is a match for it, um, and a negative image, which definitely isn't similar based on our business knowledge. Um, so triplets can be easy like this. At the top, I could have an, an image of a shoe here, be very easy. Um, or they can be hard, where this negative match, you know, a lot of people would say it's a positive match. Um, and a lot of models like that inception model would think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive match. So the distance in the default model is very small between the anchor and the negative, but yet it's a negative, it's business knowledge we have to express. So if you wanna do this, it's very hard, you have to create tools for your business users to express that knowledge. Then you take a black box model. Um, in a simplest scenario, everything is frozen. You add a few layers on the top, 
and you um, train it on the triplets. And the loss function is designed to increase the distance between the anchor and the negative and reduce the distance between the anchor and the positive. And that's what you back propagate through your uh, CNN. Or in this case, just uh, the top layers that we added. So some results, retraining with triplet loss. So that's mobile net that we showed before, very familiar, and this is um, improved version. So um, I think it's a, it's a clear improvement, um, especially you know, color-wise. Color actually turns out to be very hard um, for some reason, I don't know. It's, it's almost like a trade-off, some kind of metaphysics between shape and color. Um, deep embeddings, so everything I've shown so far was fully connected layers at the top. How can we use data directly from convolutional layers and how it is useful? Um, typically, uh, so that, that's the convolution stack that I showed. So it may have, um, let's say, 64 of those, what they call them, the feature maps. So it's, it's, it's the image transformed by scanning that filter. And the filters are different, so the depth is 64, so there's six, 64 versions of that transformation. Um, the theory is that, okay, if I take two images and the same filter, let's say one that detects edges and the other one that detects arcs or something, angles and arcs, um, activate in a similar way in those two images, it means that those images are similar to one another. So how do I check how the different convolutional layers activate? Um, I, I create a dot product of, of everyone to everyone, uh, and a dot product expresses co-activation. And that, that dot product of a stack of matrices is called a gram matrix. It's a symmetric matrix. So of course, we only need to use half of it. Um, but the problem is that if you look at the, at the size, I, I take that matrix and I flatten it and I try to use it as an embedding, that's not tractable. Um, you know, if I have you know, 500 by 500, um, um, so if I have 500 um, feature maps, 500 by 500 is uh, almost 200, 60,000, that's too many, and even half of that is 130,000, so that's, that's not useful. Um, well, you can just dimensionality reduce, right? So generate a data set with all those and uh, run PCA or something, um, well, that doesn't work. That's what you get as a result of dimensionality reduction of those flattened gram matrices. So you need to apply some other uh, transformations. Um, inside the, the model which computes the gram matrix, but it's possible to reduce dimensionality to a reasonable level. Um, and we tried that, and, and here we show um, the output of search results, top 12, by the, the, by the receptive field of the convolutional layer we use, right? So uh, we start with color channel coactivations, and we go finer grained features, more coarse grained features, more coarse grained features. And as you see, um, deep embeddings um, provide that um, balance between color and fine-grained feature, color and texture, and a more coarse-grained feature like these larger patterns here. And the theory is that at the bottom, it's you know the the receptive field is so so big on that uh, convolution that it's almost like the whole uh, the whole uh, silhouette itself. So the next um, stage is pack. Right, so apart from PCA, which I hope everybody's familiar with if, if we're talking about vectors, um, what can we do um, and how can we, let, for, for example, combine signals from multiple different models, right? So can we improve our result by combining the signals? The most obvious uh, answer to how to combine the signals is let's just concatenate vectors. Well. Um, quickly you come to realization, okay, well, one vector may have values like 0 0.001, the other one can have values like 100,000, right? And they may have different sizes. So when you concatenate, one vector will drown the other one completely. The next step, people say, well, let's just normalize the vectors so all the values are from the same range. Um, so those are intuitive. Um, it, those are intuitions that we use, um, but really when you start thinking about it, you need to um, have a function which has um, a couple of properties. One is it doesn't distort pairwise distances from the two vector spaces from which you're taking the signals. 
and two is the contribution from these two um, vector spaces is equivalent. So there is the, the, the ratio of contributions is 1.0. Um, and when you figure out that function, you can then um, first equalize the contributions from two signals and then weigh them. So you can say, okay, well, now that I know how to make them equal, I can make one more important than the other in a controlled fashion. So for example, here we take the output of inception model, which we have in production right now, and try to color correct it by taking the deep embedding, which carries color, and adding 30% of, of, of color to this inception model. Um, and we get some improvement. Of course, there's a balance between shape and color. More complex way would be to, uh, to um, try to, so if you think about PCA, right, uh, principal component analysis, you take some vector space, you apply, you train a PCA model on it, and then you project using PCA model to some lower dimension. <coughs> there is a version of that uh, that takes two vector spaces as input called canonical correlation analysis. Um, that fig tries to find uh, such projection that uh, when you look at the two projections of two vector spaces, the dimensions in the two projections have linear correlation between um, each other, right? So, um, uh, so of course, the projections uh, will be the same number of dimensions, right? Um, but, but I can take two vector spaces with completely different sets of dimensions, like 22,000 TFIDF product attributes, 2,000 inception image uh, floating points, cross decompose them into 256 plus 256, 512 dimensions. This is a linear transformation, which uh, is difficult to compute on GPU. So we can uh, kill two birds with the same stone, which is often answer in deep learning by going from the classical mathematical method to a deep learning model. Take, create a deep learning model which can achieve a nonlinear transformation, already benefit number one, put it on G GPU, benefit number two. So you have two stacks, two inputs. Uh, the two stacks create the two projections, and all you need to do is uh, train it in such a way that it um, um, uh, maximizes the correlation of the dimensions of the two outputs um, that's a custom loss function that you need to create. Then back propagation will take care of the rest. And the beauty of this is that it's straight TensorFlow implementation, put it on GPU, it's super fast. Some results. Um, trying to fuse deep embeddings the, uh, with the fine-grained features with more of the, the more coarse-grained deep embeddings. Uh, so no other signal but the image signal here. So result is not great, so let's try to take product attributes. So those uh, 22,000 dimensional TFIDF vectors I talked about, and fuse them with the deep embeddings um, coming from the, the convolutional layers. So the result is pretty good already. And the more examples, fuse product attributes with deep image, ha uh, deep image hashes. Fuse, um, um, so, so that, that by itself is good, color is a little bit off. Well, let's use that concatenation approach I described before to color correct, and, and then we get one of the best models we have um, right now. Index. So indexing um, has to do, when you, when you index uh, vectors for searching, uh, you have to make one key decision, which is what metric you use. Uh, the notion of distance between vectors comes from the notion of metric. How do you measure the length of a vector, right? There's multiple ways of doing that, as long as you're measurement uh, fits certain rules. Um, and then the difference, the metric of the, the norm of the difference between two vectors is the distance between them. So the, those, those notions are interrelated. So the classic notions are Manhattan norm and Euclidean norm. Um, these are the formula. You can look at the formula and you realize that they have one common thing between them, which is the power. Right, so with Manhattan we have power one, with Euclidean we have power two. Um, and so with Euclidean it's like school, you know, that's how you compute the, the, the length of a vector. In school, you know, you take a square and then square root. So you quickly realize you can use powers other than one and two. So you can use three, four, five, that's great, but you can also use one half, one third, one fourth, one sixth. Those are called fractional norms. So instead of taking to power and then root, you take root and then to power. 
and there has been uh, studies and literature about how for really high dimensional vector spaces these metrics fractional metrics are a lot more effective so we made an experiment you know going Euclidean distance and then comparing um, with fractional metrics uh, dropping the the fraction so this is 1.0 0.9 0.5 0.1 0 0.05 and you can see that there is a clear uh, difference in the, in, the, in the visual similarity. Um, and we're still um, uh, studying it on more examples to, 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 to try to gauge in human terms what does that mean? Um, what, what impact does it have on our perception? Um, many people probably wondering, coming from Lucene world, where's cosine distance? And this cosine distance is just a special case of Euclidean distance. It's a, Euclidean dist it's a squared Euclidean distance of normalized vectors. Uh, there's not much difference if you search with cosine or uh, Euclidean distance. Um, in images, usually people use Euclidean. In text, we use cosine because um, it's convenient. It, it, it's very fast for sparse vectors, and it fits into a range from 0 to 1 nicely. So search, we, we use multiple different, uh, we try to use the Python ecosystem, right? So, I mean, it would be nice to do this in Lucene. Um, Maybe people in the audience know what are the limitations. I heard that in Lucene you can use up to eight dimensions in the vector and not more. So that would be a problem because some of our vectors are 2,000 dimensions long uh, for nearest neighbor search. Um, so we tried some uh, Python ecosystem libraries, compared a noise very popular coming from Spotify. Uh, just a quick non-scientific measurement on a laptop. Um, so Things like annoy, very predictable, you know, um, longer to index than default, and uh, faster search, as expected. So to conclude, um, we need all this um, in solar. So I don't know how Python ecosystem, Java ecosystem, Scala ecosystem. Um, Probably there are ways to integrate on a data level. Would be nice to have native ability in Solar Lucene to do um, uh, tensor indexing, uh, nearest neighbor search, radius search on very large tensors, 2,000, 3,000. Um, uh, for processing of the models, would be nice to integrate with GPUs, right? Because when you feed forward image through a model, um, think about other types of media. Um, uh, it, it, it will not be fast for live production search. Somebody uploads an image, you have to feed it through the model. If you don't have GPU, that person is going to have latency. Um, thank you, and uh, we're, we're Macy's, we're hiring. Um, join our team. <laughs> Questions? Um, so, are you training on, on your own images or outside images as well? For some models, we do train on outside images, yes, because sometimes it's easier to find outside data sets for, for example, attributes that we don't have, right? So, like, dr uh, dress, uh, uh, neckline of a dress. We don't ha have that attributed, so we find outside data set. So you're making like you're enabling searches from outside images as well into the uh, Macy's catalog? That's the difference between visual search and visual similarity, right? right? So um, we do have fast visual search in the pipeline, but right now we're focusing on, because if you don't have good visual similarity, there's no point trying to address good visual search. And what sort of dimensions of the size that you think is a good trade off between uh, speed and accuracy? What size of, what vector dimension is good between speed and accuracy? It's very hard to tell because oftentimes what happens is um, the vector may be large, but um, when you apply dimensionality reduction to it, you realize that the search results do not really suffer. So, so you can always attempt applying that dimensionality reduction. Another, uh, another way is to look at, um, look at how your search result differs with uh, Euclidean metric versus a fractional metric. The theory is that if um, it's, oh, we're, we're being said that we're, come here, I'll, uh, 
because it's time. So, um, yeah.